We're going to caption project on this. I have to, it's a manual process all the time when I'm recording the screencast, so hopefully we can <coughs> do that, I suppose, if we are lucky. Okay, so I thought we would um, continue our discussion. I thought we'd actually do a couple of things today. Um, I was in a hurry to have us come through on Friday instead of having a makeup next week because uh, some people that we extended our invitation to have already started responding. So we thought it would be best if we covered some, um, I guess, some aspects of the calls that are going to be helpful once the speakers come through. Um, and so today, what I thought we'd do is I'll finish off this the description of um, of this uh, this second project, and then uh, I don't know how many of us uh, went through those two. Uh, the two readings to do with uh, the Crips DM model. Um, I was hoping I could co quickly walk us through the process that you'd go through if you, have, if you don't have experience um, reading peer-reviewed articles, like technical articles, right? Uh, it turns out it's, it's an important skill and very soon most of these assignments are going to be centered around generating or coming up sum with summaries, so I thought it would be nice for us to cover that. We were supposed to have covered that in lecture series number one, so I thought we'd uh, We'll do that after I finish off the the um, the part to do with uh, there we go the the part to do with this crisp DM uh, example example that follows the crisp DM model essentially, and then we will jump right straight through to discuss our uh, just a, a, a little bit of a crash course we to look at. Just the importance. We're just going to gloss over the, the important aspects of. Python and some of the tools we're going to be using because we noticed last year that some people um, struggled to make sense out of the, the Jupyter notebooks that we were using. So I, I thought we'd just quickly walk us through that and then do a crash course kind of a session in Python and focus more on the, the is it three or two core modules? So Python Pandas, uh, Matplotlib, uh, and Scikit-Learn be because very soon I think in the next lecture series we'll start using some of these Python libraries. Uh, so before we continue off, I just wanted to let us know that uh, we uh, we have out of the is it eight people that we've invited so far, we we have confirmed participation from four people. Uh, so the first speaker is going to be let's do that. First speaker is going to be uh, Francis, right? Who's coming through after next week, I think. Um, essentially, what, like I said, he worked on an image classification problem, so his talk is uh, it's going to be centered around that. Right? And if you're interested in tools like uh, ten, the TensorFlow or something, if you have specific questions on that, you probably want to use this opportunity to ask him questions on that because he, that's, that's the platform he used. Um, and then immediately after Francis, we have uh, uh, Dr. Zulu, who is uh, the registrar at UTH for is it the radiology department. So he's going to come through here to walk us through the pipeline or the process that they use to analyze x-rays and CT scans and God knows what, what else they, they produce there. I think this is going to be really interesting. Uh, interesting for me because uh, they go through a manual process. So don't expect any discussion of like uh, fancy algorithms and computer science. It's purely going to be him walking us through their end-to-end -end process. Um, and then, well, there's a gap here. Hopefully, the, the other people that haven't responded will have responded by then. But Emmanuel has been working with us. Uh, uh, he says stock exchange data. So he's he's working on his, I think, his second master's or something. I don't know why, why but uh, he's doing it with some institution somewhere out there. And so um, I learned about his work when I attended some colloquium at Zika's a few weeks ago. And so I thought it would be nice to have him come through and discuss um, I guess the kind of area that we haven't really had speakers come through to give talks. Um, although also we extended an invitation for, is it the chief information officer or whatever from ABSA, from maybe Barclays or something. So interesting things coming up. And then at some stage, uh, a student that I'm working with, I don't know why he chose the last day uh, on the slot here, but he's going to come and give a talk about the project he's working towards. I think if we were to estimate, it's probably maybe a quarter way through or something. Uh, there's interesting stuff to do with um, the process he's been going through to collect data, to clean up the data. So this would be perfect because we'd have covered most of the most of the things associated with the cause, especially when it comes to classification, right? Because he's purely working on a, uh, a document classification problem, essentially. Uh, 
Okay. I don't know if people tried out, I haven't even checked in a while if, um, <laughs> if, if this API is actually weak. Uh, lost hope because the students I was working with were meant to implement some fancy UI that was meant to be used by postgraduate students, but um, I think they're not yet up to speed, which is quite sad. Right, so there's, there's this other project that uh, I've been thinking about, and the motivation for me behind this is, is I mean, it stems from the fact that um, that since I started teaching this course, it's, it's, it's offered in the School of Education, but the program it's associated with is a, it's a Bachelor of ICT with Education, so it's a newly introduced program uh, because of the recent introduction of visit computer studies and whatnot in, in high schools and primary schools, I'm told now. Right? So what we've noticed right, from the time the course was launched, which is 2018, is that the failure rate is quite high. Right? Um, and, uh, and like some people, some colleagues have spoken, with, uh, spoken to about results where I remember one of the things that some lecturer from Bowage told us, you know, our first lecture is half of you will go. I don't believe in that. I, I think there's, um, there's things, there's interventions that we can introduce here to ensure that as many people as possible actually pass, um, especially the things are changing now. Apparently, Senate has come up with certain policies where a student can repeat as long, however times you want, there's nothing like school exclude now, right? Things have changed. So, but anyway, my interest in all of this is to see how I can ensure that more people pass the course, or at least get good marks in the CA, right? So, um, this snapshot just shows you the performance of students in continuous ass assessment score here, really bad here. Um, these are somewhat good, the good scores, I guess, I must have ordered them somehow here. Uh, but to give you some context of what this is all about here, out of the entire CA, which is 50%, the last column here tells you the percentage that the student needs to get for them to pass. Now, the problem with this course is that it's a year-long course and it combines computer systems and computer architecture, right? When I was a student myself, um, um, I didn't do that as one course, it was two separate courses. And so the, the idea behind that is we think that there are certain markers that we can use to identify at-risk students. Um, and, 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 and so the obvious, the obvious markers, we well, talk about the markers just now anyway. So we, we, are, we are planning to do, uh, to combine traditional characteristics or factors together with, um, with um, we think that there's certain things we can pull out from students' digital trails. So if we are to analyze Moodle, for instance, various features there, um, would we be able to find a correlation between uh, how often a user or a student logs into Moodle to check for things and whether or not they perform well, right? Um, you know, there's funny things here. How often they uh, participate in other course activities that are not necessarily graded, like uh, we have a mailing list and we encourage a lot of interaction. Some students are active, some of them are not, right? Um, funny things like we share Google Slides of, of the notes and encourage them to look for mistakes. If they find mistakes, they annotate that. And the idea is to, to engage them in the course and hopefully you know, in the process they, they'll get to you know, perform better than they would. And the traditional markers we're talking about, by the way, things like demographic, right? So which school were you at, for instance? Did you do a computer-related course before? And things of that nature. <clears throat> right, so the goal, identifying at-risk students, right? And again, if we were to go through this, um, the business understanding part for me is pretty straightforward. I started thinking about this after I had taught this course for, for almost two years. Well, for a year at least, right? So um, I, had an, I have, or at least at the time I started thinking about this, I already had an in-depth understanding of the domain I was working in. I, th I think I have a pretty good idea as to what influences students to pass or fail. I mean, it's things like, uh, because they minor in certain other courses, right? Some courses are very involving, time consuming, so we think that there's a correlation between that as well. Right. <clears throat> right, and so the objective really would be to monitor, right, students' performance from the time they start writing assessments, so quiz one up to the last quiz, which is quiz 20, the tests, you know, um, 
uh, we start collecting or we start passing through an attendance register in the tutorial sessions to see if uh, um, there's a correlation again between someone attending tutorial sessions and um, uh, and lecture sessions as well. Right. So no need for us to conduct a situation analysis because uh, we already know what the problem is all about here. Right. We haven't really gone through a thorough process of creating a project timeline per se, but uh, it's work in progress anyway. Um, and then in terms of data understanding, we've come up with um, with a list of data sources that we think we can extract this information from. Right. So the obvious one are the assessment results. Right? So these things here. We compile these religiously. We, we have, on average, we have a quiz every week, right? Um, which is pretty decent, I guess. Um, sorry. So the data sources, the assessment results, student demographics, we have this information from SIS. They've done a really good job of um, collecting really useful information. So we know where these students come from whether they are from the eastern part or which part exactly in the eastern province are they from, which school were they at, how old are they, um, which courses, a G GCE did they write, right? So all those different factors, we think we can incorporate them into these models that we're thinking of implementing, right? Um, so student past experience, um, what we've, we started doing beginning last year is we, we send out a preliminary survey to the students to collect this sort of information. So we ask for things like, um, what motivated you to do this course, um, to see if there's a correlation between motivation and um, performance of the student. Um, uh, what else, if you have prior computing experience, for instance, right? So we've designed a survey. Um, if you want, I can share this afterwards, just write me mail, the, the survey itself. It's a simple survey, really. <coughs> um, and then the Moodle interaction logs. Really rich data set here, and fortunately for us, we've uh, before Moodle was mandated, uh, it was quite sad. Very few people use this, and we found it really hard to convince our students to use Moodle, but we found a work around. All grades are only accessible online. If we have an assessment, like a take-home quiz, you can only submit it using the Moodle. And so in the process, students got used to using Moodle. So we have a rich data set from Moodle here, the interaction logs. Um, and then the, the issue of tutorial attendance is a, is a tricky one. <laughs> Because usually this is a class of uh, anywhere between 60 and 90 students, right? So passing around an attendance register is just not for me. There's an interesting study that I, uh, I know was done by someone from UCT. It's computer vision. So what this person did was um, he was trying to see if he could automate the process of um, attendance of students. So you would get a panoramic uh, image of the entire class and do some simple image recognition, right? So you. You train some learning algorithm to say this person is uh, Mumbi, this person is Brian, right? And then when you take that image, it's able to detect the different faces. I mean, this is a well-known problem. Um, there's well-known solutions actually to this issue. So if you think of Google Photos, for instance, it automatically does this, right? Um, we were thinking this is something that we can do, right? For a large class, I don't have time to take attendance. So maybe just develop some simple tool that we can use or something, I don't know how that would work, maybe backward read or something, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, so lecture attendance, and then the tutor feedback as well, this is really important because there's regular interaction between tutors and the students, right, in the smaller groups. So they're in a better position to identify the different traits associated with the students. We also take, we started taking uh, attendance um, last year. Okay, and then, so extraction of the data is pretty easy here. The assessment results, we have control over this because we compile these ourselves, right, still on that understanding. Extracting information from SIS is not that hard, um, although the data will probably need a little bit of cleaning up, depending on which, which attributes you're interested in. And then the, remember I mentioned um, the questionnaire that we dish out, this we have control of as well. <coughs> so we've already done some sort of, uh, at least with the data set we're working with last year, we've done some you know, exploratory data analysis and we have a fairly good idea of the, um, the, the, the I guess the visuals associated with the different data sets here that we, we are thinking of incorporating into this. Of course, I mean, we could go on and on um, identifying potential attributes that we can link into this, but that's besides the point. And then for data preparation, obviously, I mean, uh, uh, one of the 
So one, uh, one of the, this is going to be one of the data sets that we're going to be working on, so we'll have an opportunity to, to see the process that you'd go through if you're wanting to prepare data associated with this. Um, so just to give you an idea, these, the, the CSV files are associated with the different assessments, so quizzes, right, uh, tests, um, whatnot. And what we're thinking of doing also is, uh, because each quiz is based on a particular theme or topic, we're thinking of trying to see if there's a, a correlation between uh, performance of students and a particular topic. Uh, we, we do have an anecdotal evidence that seems to suggest that uh, the computer architecture component is slightly a um, bit difficult, at least the performance is really bad there. Okay. But, um, right, so just a, a sample of how the data looks like. This is the assessment, the quiz, right? user details, computer number, and the marks. Um, but of course, I mean, at some point we merge this data set, like this data set would be merged by information coming in from SIS, which has specifics of which which program the student is minoring in and which courses they are doing. Um, the interaction logs here, just uh, again, data preparation is pretty straightforward here. Um, just because the, the standard, I mean, we're putting this information from MySQL, so it's, it's, it already has some predefined structure, so it's not really that hard to work with, with this data. The only, I guess the only challenge would be to not that it's challenging, but really filter out the different features associated with Moodle. Because it turns out that some students would only be interested in just checking their grade book. Some students would only be interested in checking notes when there is a test, right? Um, so we want to see uh, the interaction logs associated with the different features of Moodle. Right, so again, still on data sources here, or data preparation, this is a survey form I was talking about, uh, where we are collecting this type of information here. And again, we'll go through a process of once it doesn't, you can collect as, as much information as you can about the domain you're working in. What's important is to go through a feature selection process where you identify um, the characteristics of the factors that highly influence and have a, a relatively higher causal effect on the overall outcome. All right, I mean, so these are the, 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 the things that we'd normally do here because we are mostly working with text here, so it will be mostly text processing here when it comes to cleaning up. And the obvious, you know, deduplicating records and checking for null values. Uh, because we have substantially large data set, we can, we can get away with excluding certain students that fell off. Uh, we have students that wrote some assessments and then somewhere around quiz number three, quiz number four, we stopped seeing them, right? They just vanished. You don't want to include those people. Um, unless if you had a uh, smaller number of observations. Um, and then so the merging process would really involve uh, combining sources coming in from those different sources. So the survey itself, the, the Moodle interaction logs, the uh, student assessments, right? And then the, the, final, the, the final data frame that you come up with is what you use as input to, um, to this learning algorithm, right? And of course, it, it has to be labeled to a certain extent. So what that means, and we discussed what this means is that um, would, if, we are use, if we are looking at implementing this model using it this year, we would use last year's data to prepare our training set. So we label them because we know who passed and who failed. And then using the result that comes from there, we would then use observations from this year, like after we write quiz number two. We feed the learning algorithm the input from the students and then it's able to tell us to say, this particular student is at risk or something. Um, fortunately for us, we can easily verify after deploying the model, model if it's actually working because we're we have control, we, we are working on the solution and then we are also the customers at the same time. Um, really, I mean, in terms of modeling, this is a classification problem here, um, nothing new, right? All we are, we are doing here is trying to see, is this student at risk or not, right? And we can do fancy things uh, or, uh, by coming up with the, uh, uh, well, I don't know if, at, yeah, at risk is the goal here, but but maybe in certain courses, some people, if they were wanting to use this in a different course, they would be interested in 
maybe ensuring that as many students as possible get A pluses, right? That would be like a different use case, I don't know. Or as many students as possible get at least a B, in which case you'd need B, B plus, A, A plus, right? What I'm trying to say is, it's entirely possible that the objective wouldn't necessarily have been at risk or not at risk. It could be much more than that. And the, the evaluation is pretty straightforward. We have, we have a data set that we can easily label. It's already labeled, actually. Um, and all we'll be doing here is looking at the, fundamentally, the accuracy of these models, right? Uh, maybe also, so this, was, this would be the overall accuracy, but, but what would be interesting as well is looking at uh, the accuracy uh, in terms of, I suppose, the, um, the accuracy in pay minor. We have students that are minoring in maths, civic education, languages, right? So would we be able to notice um, an inter-minor difference insofar as the accuracy is concerned? Perhaps this thing would only be more accurate for maths majors, who knows, right? Maybe civic education, or minor, sorry. I don't know. So these are things to think about. And the other obvious metrics that you'd be looking at, the traditional metrics is the F score, um, F1 score, the precision and the recall, which we we'll discuss. Because we are the ones who would want to use this, we wouldn't mind if, if, if the implementation only went as far as uh, an API of sorts that we feed. So I have five students, I just feed those observations to the model and then the model just spits out some JSON uh, response and tells me to say this person is at risk, this person is is not at risk, right? I don't mind that. But if this was being made for somebody else, perhaps some people in Agric, they perhaps don't know what JSON is, you'd need to implement some, some really fancy interface, I suppose. Or not really fancy, maybe a simple thing that allows someone to just type in student ID and marks, or just student mark or something, I don't know. Well, not student marks, but sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. An interface that allows this person to type in all those different attributes. It would be hard in certain instances, but in certain instances it wouldn't be hard. So in the example of this, the input observation, once you train the model, would be all those things associated with the performance of the student, right? The assessment, the input coming in from the survey, right? Those different attributes, which hardly ever change. The only moving target is the assessment here. Um, the demographic the information coming in from SIS, Right, so those would be your input, right, to the implemented model, and then um, it obviously gives you the result that you hopefully expect, or that's going to be useful in a way. Can't really think of any any other way of implementing this. I hope I hope this gives a, so the the idea behind this is I was wanting us to understand this. Everything we're going to be doing is centered around this. Um, after today's crash course, next week we start this part here. So essentially what we are mostly doing in the course, like I said, are these three things here. We don't touch this. This we assume someone is going to learn depending on the type of problem they're going to be working on. Um, if not, you engage experts. Um, and then this is an obvious thing here. So if there are no questions, then maybe, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because many on what you are trying to achieve is prediction. Here, for this? Not only the yeah, I, and I, so, sorry, I have to say this. A lot of people think what I do is boring. <laughs> and I'm sorry, you're going to have, to, you, you won't be pleased because, no, but the, what I do myself is I, this, these are areas that I am passionate about. I spent a lot of time in uh, like exploring uh, technology enhanced learning. So I've become somewhat of like a, an expert sort of, and very much interested. Most of what I write about is actually here and and digital libraries, right? and these are like obscure areas that, uh, so if you come and visit me, you find posters about this and people just they look at what I do and I don't know what they think, you know. but the, yes, the question. So the question is, so uh, what do you then do after finding uh, whether a student is at risk? Oh, so what I would do myself is I would have, um, one of the interventions is creating dedicated time to get myself together with the tutors Maybe we could form a, a special tutorial group where we have more contact hours for the students. Because right now the assumption is you are, just have a tutorial, one is it two hours in a week. 
you meet everyone as a group, you don't know the level everybody is at, right? You don't know what problems they're exp uh, experiencing. So there's that. And then what, what I've been doing uh, since I, I joined this institution is, I, I guess I'm still in the honeymoon phase. I still reach out when I notice someone is not performing as expected. I reach out, I, I go out of my way actually. What help do you need, right? Uh, so that's what I would do. I can't do that for a hundred students, but I can do that if, if we find out that it's 20 of them that are at risk, right? I can do that. So, so that's, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Yes. I just have a question also like on the same condition. So what was happening with this? Like people were failing? Or yes, people are still failing. I have to show you this. And it's not like I'm pleased to to do to do this, but I have to show you this, right? Uh, we just had a despite the confusion here, we had a quiz and I had a lecture with the students um, a few days ago and we were discussing their results for quiz number one. The problem is they're still failing every year, irrespective of the cohort. And usually you know what they say about um, about uh, oh, successive generations are smarter. It, it's not working for us. It's still they, everybody who comes in, 2018 cohort bad performance. 2019 bad performance. This cohort. So this is how bad the situation is. This is just quiz one. Simple stuff, right? And I understand. I mean, for a first quiz, I guess uh, there's a bit, a bit of confusion. We're trying to avoid this, right? This is not normal, you know. Only 20. Is it 20? 6.2% people pass quiz one. We're trying to avoid this. No one is happy about this because it turns out that if, if a lot of people are failing and they've been failing since 2018, maybe the problem is with you, right? Not the students, actually. I'm just speculating here that the problem is with the students. I, I do think it's with the students, though, but <laughs> I don't know. Um, so yeah, so the, the problem is that students are failing. They've been failing since this course started. Um, And I, I think Onza would be interested in this. Why? We are cash strapped now. You, want, you don't want people to fail anymore, right? You want them to pass so that they continue paying the tuition fees, in my opinion, anyway. But, uh, but anyway, so that's, but I'm not using that as a motivation for me. But maybe Onza would be interested in doing that. Uh, on, on the hindsight, I mean, if you think about it, something like this could potentially be scaled up to say maybe uh, and of course, the attributes would be different here, the features, but maybe uh, in high schools, right? So that we, although now apparently we have, is it 90 plus percent pass rates or something at grade 12? I remember hearing about this. Right? But if it was bad, maybe we would deploy a model like this there. Yeah, so I guess I'm trying to, to, to tag into the generalization issue so we can generalize this a, a bit by modifying them. So, yeah. Just go back to that, uh, that log file. Is it a log file? This? No, 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 go back to the CSV files. CICT? Yeah, just there. Here. Just there. Oh, so, this? I want, I want to find out those uh, CSV results. Yes. Are you, are you using a script to group them together? Or well, so I, um, I spent years studying digital libraries. I curate my information. Quail, right? I don't know if you've noticed what I'm doing here. I go through a manual process. Every time they write a quiz, this is transcribed. So it's a paper-based quiz. Sometimes it's, an, it's a take-home quiz. But for in-class quizzes, they have 15 minutes, or 13 minutes anyway, to write the quiz, and then it's marked. Once it's marked, this has to be entered into Mundo, but in the process, we transcribe this information. I can show you, uh, I guess it's, t it's important to look at this because it ties into the data preparation part, I suppose. So if I show you, perhaps not here, is it here? Let's look at last year's because it's, it's a rich, richer data set. Uh, we'll go to this. You know, I'll look at the consolidated uh, script, hope this is the one. <clears throat> so every time a quiz is written, um, I hope these things are masked, but it's fine. It's not, uh, every time a quiz is written, this is what we do, right? I, we take note of, um, yeah, these things are what we're interested in, the mark. So, I, so all the assessments, quizzes, all the 20 quizzes, the tests, um, 
and maybe we could also, we are reaching here, but maybe also get uh, results coming in from the tutorial sessions. You never know, right? The, the idea behind feature extraction is get as much data as you can get and then remove what is not important, what does not influence what you're hunting for. So these, these are manually compiled. At the end of it all, we, and I think one of the data sets we're going to be working on is actually, okay, is actually, is actually the compiled, the final compiled, uh, the final compiled um, uh, file, oh, it's the same one. So afterwards, I mean, it's very primitive data, <laughs> data um, compilation or analysis. Let's look at the master thing so that you see the final consolidated thing. So afterwards, um, the things you're seeing are compiled, how are they compiled? Not here. Yeah, so afterwards, we just link the, the different um, information coming in from those CSV files. So those are manually compiled anyway. So, um, it's a manual process. But we do it anyway, so we might as well just uh, use it. So it's not like it's, and it's not really a lot of work. Well, maybe it is for some people uh, when you're typing with two fingers. Okay, if there are no questions, then maybe we can, and unless if there are more questions. Uh, really, uh, I was, uh, um, my interest in all of this is to ensure that all of us understand this because that was the whole point of this. There are more people that are going to come through to run us through different projects. Um, some of them might not explicitly walk you through this process, but you should be in a position to figure out to say, oh, that what he's talking about is the data preparation stage. Right? Especially when Francis comes through, and especially that he's going to be looking at a different type of data set, right, images. Uh, be interested in hearing thoughts about that. Okay, so if, if there are no questions, then maybe we can quickly uh, do the next thing, which I said was, uh, it, it's been pending before we get on to uh, getting started, the crash course introduction to Python. Uh, <clears throat> so, so the reason why I think this is important is if you are, if you're really interested in understanding what goes on uh, in any field, right? Um, at this stage, you want to develop the habit of reading what other people are doing, right? And, and I cannot emphasize enough how important this is. I, I know most of what I know was mostly from the reading sessions we used to have. In the lab I was in, it was mandatory for us to meet um, as a group because my supervisor had a number of students, so every week, whether you liked it or not, well, maybe if you are sick, perhaps not, or you're in the field or something, but you attend the, 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 the group reading sessions were mandatory. And the process, you, you read a number of things because uh, would rotate, right? So <clears throat> you suggest a paper, you suggest a paper, and the interests are different, so you get to read widely, right? So bottom line is you want to read um, as you prepare for next, next, next year. But more importantly for us, because there are some assignments that are going to involve a bit of reading and summaries, right? So I thought this would be nice. Um, my, my first hint for you is, uh, you want to, if you, if you haven't been exposed to any bibliographic manager, you, you want to evaluate what works for you. I have been using Mendeley for almost a decade now. It works really well for me, and this is probably what I would recommend you use. But there's more. There's Zotero. I don't know if you've heard of Zotero. I don't know how many people have did that final year project. Nobody has used a bibliographic manager in here. Um, so what it does is it allows you to compile, it allows you to compile, and we're still on reading sessions here, don't worry. But it allows you to compile papers that you're reading. And what I like about something like Mendeley is it actually allows you to annotate the paper. So you notice that once you start doing a literature review, maybe you read a number of papers. What some people do, and, and I have friends who did this, is you print them out and then you have a highlighter, right? You invest money in a highlighter and then you, you're highlighting and writing inside those those things you're reading. But the question though is, when you want to refresh those things, is it going to be really easy for you to know what you wrote about, right? Especially when you're writing your literary review, it's something that's going to evolve throughout the duration of you doing the phase two of your, of your program, right? The beauty with Mendeley is um, it allows you to annotate 
uh, work. I wish I could show you an example here. Let's see. Um, I hope I have, uh, probably not. It allows you to annotate, to annotate your work, and then nothing. Okay, maybe it's because it's not synchronized or something. I don't know. <clears throat> and you can search through the annotations. So if I'm compiling work to do with um, with uh, something that's going to feed into the literature review, I know beforehand I'll, I'll start annotating them in such a way that I can just lift the text that I've written about the paper and feed it into my rated work chapter. Also, the process of uh, citing work and generating a bibliography is automated, right? So you don't have to manually do these things. If, you're, uh, if, if somebody tells you, like I know one of the requirements in the assignments, the reading assignments is use IEEE or ACM referencing style. You don't have to worry. Some, some people get headaches about that. You don't have to worry with this. It's an automated process, right? So, uh, I guess we might as well look at this. We do have a bit of time here. If I'm uh, if I'm writing an article, this is what I mean by automating the process is I'll just say, oh, I want to insert a citation here, and I don't know if I'm talking about things that people already know here, right? Uh, you do, right? You do, right? Oh, then let's stop, okay. So you know what we are doing here, okay. So this is it, um, right. So you don't have to manually do these things. Um, and then the other thing, let's go to things that people don't know then. The, <clears throat> the other thing is where to find resources. The go-to place these days is uh, the, the now famous Google Scholar, right? But, but be aware that uh, Google Scholar indexes everything including gray literature, right? So if you were to search Lighton's name in Google Scholar, you'd be amazed. Some of the results uh, are linked to his website, right? That's gray literature. Some of the works are linked to, I guess, venues um, where work has to be peer reviewed, right? So you have to be careful about that. Um, so there's Google Scholar, it's an obvious go-to point. The only thing you have to, to be on the lookout for are metrics like, uh, like the, um, the, Number of citations, so if it's articles. Um, I don't know what's happening here, but anyway. So number of citations, or, I don't know what's happening here. Or if you're searching for, if you're searching for a publication venue, there's an H index. So if you can search Zambia ICT uh, journal, and then it will give you a number called the H index. It's, it's a relative measure of how good a venue is, right? So these are things to do. But there are other more focused venues, like if you go to places like A minor, they actually curate different computing fields and rank publication venues and papers there, right? There's a dedicated, because of how important data mining is, there's actually a dedicated uh, topic or a tag called databases and data mining. You find really nice and classic papers here. Um, there are some people that have come up with curated lists, like if you go here, what, what Jeff Huang does is he religiously, meticulously keeps track of best papers that are coming through from these prestigious venues. These are like top tier venues, right? So things like SIGI are, um, I guess Kai, for instance, SIGI. Um, right, so there's bound to be something to do with data mining here, I think. KDD, right, Knowledge Discovery Data Mining. Um, and then, of course, our very own, right? Because as you're doing your literature, it's highly likely that you'd be working on problems that other people have done. So if I were you, I would bookmark these because there are issues that are regularly churned out, right? And also, it's nice to read up on um, research that's done locally so that you see what people are up to. Um, but in terms of how to read a paper, uh, I know I first of all started out, uh, where it was hard for me to you know, figure out how to, how to read peer-reviewed work here. I know the uh, first couple of papers I read, I would spend days even, you know. But uh, the process proposing this paper is quite useful. I find it useful. I still refer to this. It's like a reference for me, actually. I, I almost always recommend this. I would encourage you to, to do that, right? Uh, and so the process described here is uh, typically your paper will have these different, these different sections, yeah, at least a computer science paper, right? Um, 
you know, in certain, in certain fields, you probably wouldn't have a, a part that involves development of an artifact, like a software artifact or implementation of hardware or something, right? But fundamentally, in computer science, this is what you expect. So what this paper does is, um, Keshev recommends that you go through uh, three passes, right? Where in the first pass, you just gloss over, you skim through the paper, and you just read the title. There's rich information in the title. So you read the title, and then you read the abstract, which is usually less than 500 words. You give a, it's like a summary to a certain extent, right? Typically, a good abstract will have uh, uh, five key things. Problem, motivation, um, proposed solution, approach, which is a methodology, right? Experimentation, results, conclusion, right? Of course, motivation and problem are really lumped as one. So five key aspects. So when you read an abstract, you, you are able to get a comprehensive overview of what the paper is about. Um, <clears throat> Right, and then you, funny enough, you actually read the headings of the sections, right? So the, the sections and the subsections, the headings. Sometimes they might not be labeled as related work or evaluation, they might be labeled differently. So that information gives you an idea of what the paper is about. It will tell you whether it's a math intensive paper, in which case you probably have to spend a lot of time, right? If you're not familiar with the maths in there. But you read the headings, right? You read the conclusion because it's relatively short. It will tell you what came out of the paper, key things. And then you go through the references. And what I do myself when I'm going through the references, the idea is to look at uh, key papers that these people are citing. If you look at this, uh, this citation graph for most of these papers, you are bound to find something that has been cited the most, right? Um, it's funny, one of the things I start doing when I'm reading work that has been done by others, like peer reviewing, is I go to the references and I first of all check if everything that has been referenced has been cited, and I look at the statistics. How many times, which is the most highly cited paper, right? Because that will give you an idea of what work is strongly related to the paper you are reading. Perhaps you might need to read the stuff that is highly cited. And in most instances, what people will do is they build up on already existing work, right? most likely the one that's highly cited. So the key outcome of this is you'll be able to classify what sort of paper it is, right? Like if it's computer science, is it an experimental paper? Is it an implementation paper? Are they proving uh, an existing theory, for instance? Right, all those fancy things. Is this some sort of uh, HCI-centric paper where they just build, built some software and then did a usability study or user experience study, right? Um, but you'd know what class the paper is. If you go to SCM, SCM has the different classifications for these papers, right? Um, and then the context within which this paper was written, where the correctness, the relative correctness of the paper, right? I mean, you'd be amazed how many things seep through the cracks, right? If I know that uh, publishing will result in uh, my being promoted, it can be tempting to do things that are untoward. Uh, I think I was indoctrinated into believing that it's a bad thing, and I do know it's a bad thing, so I wouldn't do that, but I'm just saying. You'd know that uh, the paper is correct, whether there's, there's anything iffy about the paper. But sometimes correctness would involve maybe an error in the math, right? Some sort of proof that is in the paper, for instance. Right? So you should be able to do that. And the key contribution, because everything that is published, at least in these prestigious journals, must clearly state what it is they're bringing to the table. What is new? Have you invented uh, a more superior algorithm, for instance? Um, did you conduct some study in Zambia that uh, generated new knowledge? We should ask Francis when he comes to what was the contribution of your work, right? When you came up with, when you worked on this image classification problem of four amulets, or what is the, well, what's the novelty of what you did, right? And the relative clarity of the paper. Did you not get confused or something, right? Was it clear enough? Second pass, uh, you're analyzing the floats, right? So these are tables, figures, equations, right, in detail. Um, again, you note uh, key references that you would not have gone through here, right? Uh, and then maybe go through them. <clears throat> At this point, once you read it a second time, you probably have a comprehensive understanding of the paper, actually. And some, uh, I guess in some of the papers, people will say, you should be able to Reproduce the paper in a way, right? Because you understand it somehow, right? Um, and then in pass number three uh, is the time for you to to identify fundamental flaws in the paper. So things things to do because this paper almost always has 
evaluation, implementation, right? You check. Um, is there something wrong with the experimental design, the execution of the experiment itself? Uh, maybe the selection of um, participants of the study was a bit uh, iffy, right? If it's a user study. Um, perhaps the way that uh, the hardware setup was, was described is, is a bit problematic. You highlight all those different things. Um, also, I guess to do with results here, uh, a lot of people obsess, and this will come up a lot, right? Uh, did you conduct any statistical tests, right? What statistical tests uh, did you perform? Can we generalize the outcomes of your study, right? These are the things you check for in parts number three. Uh, for the most part, well, you typically would just go through three passes, depending on the complexity of the paper, but if it's, it's something that is um, a relatively unfamiliar field for you, I mean, you could, you could probably go through uh, pass number three again. But details of what I just said are in here. I do encourage you to read this, please. Quite nice. Okay, that, 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 that's it on this. Maybe we can now get started into the Python thing. This was in lecture series number, it was a remnant of lecture series number one. We're supposed to dis discuss this in lecture series number one, but it's fine. And then hopefully now when we send through an assignment to do with uh, a paper reading, we should be in a position to, to uh, figure things out here. That and, and uh, this is what I highly recommend. That paper and, hmm, it's not here, I guess. Okay, that's fine. I wonder where it is. It's another paper, I know. <clears throat> so for, for those that, that were late, by the way, I'd, I'd asked if, um, if anyone went through the two readings from, from the previous lecture. Remember the things that are linked to the CRISPR model because uh, I wanted to hear people's thoughts about, uh, you know, how, whether papers were well written, um, but maybe we can revisit the papers and just read up on that. And maybe the question you asked is actually hidden in there. You remember, right? Yeah, I was hoping someone would say, I found a solution in the paper or something, but I don't know. Um, Okay, maybe we can get our hands uh, a bit dirty soon after this crash course introduction, I guess. I don't know if there are no questions. I, I made the, the stupid assumption last year of assuming that maybe Python had become mainstream here as well. You know that in other places now, and a lot has been written about this, by the way, in, in other places, uh, Python has been, uh, is is being used as an introductory programming language. Right? Uh, I know the, the, my alma mater uh, started doing this, I think, two years uh, into my, a year into my master's, I think. And it's, I seem to think it works quite well. Before then, they used to use Java as an introductory language, but what they do now is they do that, they introduce students to Java at second year. Right? So pretty useful language, I suppose. So I made the assumption that people would already know Python, which is why I did a poll last time to find out, and I think it was only one person who has some um, knowledge of Python, but that's fine. It's a simple language, I assure you. It's, it's very simple, I really like it. Uh, I mostly use it for scripting myself, nothing more than scripting. <clears throat> but anyway, so I thought I'd split up this uh, lecture session into three main parts. We shall first of all, again, people struggled with, I don't know how many people have used Jupyter Notebooks before, Jupyter Lab, or Google Colab, it's a good thing that I included this. Most of the, the, the code that I'm going to be sharing are shared here, right? Um, and it tends, well, and then afterwards we'll look at, we'll dive into Python, just look at the bare basics to get us started. The reason, by the way, we're going through Python is very soon the next lecture starts, uh, the, the, there's a bit of code there, and we don't want people to get lost in, when they're reading through the code, right? So that's the idea behind this. And then we'll just look at a few core modules, the Python um, modules associated with this. All right, so just a sneak preview of this thing called Jupyter Notebooks. If you look up online, I guess what we're going to be looking at is so-called Jupyter Notebooks Classic. I recently discovered that uh, Jupyter Lab, one word, is almost becoming mainstream, right? Uh, but the functionality is more or less the same anyway. So if you, but it has fancy features like you can open tabs apparently or something. I, I like Jupyter Notebooks Classic myself, it's just fine, right? 
And what we're going to do is we really just walk through the simple interface so that you're able to execute the code on your own, right? And then just walk through the three key types of uh, content that you will find in these notebooks when I'm sharing them. And in fact, when you're looking up information when you come across these notebooks, these are the three different types of content that you're going to find. Uh, all right, so it's a, I guess the motivation behind this is this notion of reproducible research. Um, uh, uh, so with something like Jupyter Notebooks, I can share with you things that I've been working on and hope you should be able to re-execute whatever it is I did and get the same, if not similar results, right? Or similar, yeah, no, it's the exact same one, except somewhat closer, uh, the results that are somewhat closer to what you're doing here. <clears throat> Right, so you can view a notebook as nothing more than, uh, it's a web application actually, you run it as a web application. Um, and, and really this web application contains uh, content, textual content, live code, right? So it could be Python, or uh, if you've incorporated some sort of like shell scripts there, you can run shell commands, um, um, visualizations and equations if you're working on some math problem, for instance. Um, I like the fact that you can actually, I don't know if you can see this, but you can actually integrate LaTeX within this, right? So it's a lot easier to work with equations. And then you can also visualize things within the, the notebook itself, right? Um, without this, I, I guess you'd have to do some of these things separately. Think about this for a second. You'd have to, uh, I don't know, the live code would probably be in some external file, the equation, some document or something, the visuals are separate as well, right? But this integrates everything into just one, um, unified component. Um, and then it turns out that if you look at this, this is what they call the kernel, right? So uh, in as much as most people use this for Python 3, but you can, you can actually use other kernels that will allow you to run languages like R, right? Um, so you just have to install the kernel itself. <coughs> right, and, and I thought I'd mention here, in case you, you struggle installing this or something, the alternative here, this is how you install it, but the alternative is Google Collaboratory. So it's like, um, uh, it's Jupyter Notebooks in the cloud, right? Uh, so you just have to go here, um, and then I guess you just have to associate your Google Gmail account, and then you have, you have this interface. It's more or less similar to, to the Jupyter Notebook Classic here. The only difference is, like I, I get to do more here, and in certain instances, I find myself working offline, so I wouldn't want to, um, to be connected, the times when maybe I might not have an internet connection, the obvious things here, right? There's no way of working offline like you can with Google Docs or Google Sheets here. <coughs> right, um, and then in terms of the UI, really, it's a very basic thing. The key things that you need to pay particular attention to are the cells here, which is where you write the code and the textual content, right? Uh, and the shell, shell commands, and the, also the magics. So this is an example of a cell. And uh, executing this cell when you write code like this is as simple as just pressing the run button or shift enter, right? And then boom, the result comes up. For the most part, the result will be immediately after the cell um, where you executed, uh, uh, where you ran that command from. So it will appear right below here. Except for, for, for things like these, I had to install like um, an additional component is a plugin. So you won't really see output. This enables me to generate PDF files that I can share. Um, <clears throat> right, so the, the other things here, like the things like the two bars, I mean, you can create a new, uh, the obvious things, right? Open a, a new notebook, you create a new notebook, you run the entire notebook as a whole, right? So you go to, uh, and I guess maybe it would be nice if I, <clears throat> if I, when we're running through the interface, if I, Right, so when you, maybe actually I should probably run uh, something that has a uh, nice content.
something from last year. That would be nice. So when you run the when you run Jupyter Notebook for the first time, I mean, this is what you are presented with, and so all you do is you execute one of the notebooks. The notebooks are, have an extension of uh, IPYNB, right? IPython notebook. It previously used to be called IPython. <coughs> right. So what I was saying is, um, once you write your commands, uh, you can use these menu items, the toolbar, to actually do a number of things. So for instance. Instead of individually running, so this is called textual content, I execute it, this is what happens. This is Python code, this is live code, I execute, let's look at something that has out output here. There we go. Uh, I, I'll reset this. <coughs> so we see what's happening behind the scenes. So, notebook for the first time, uh, I can execute it cell by cell, right? When I execute a part that has live code, I see the output immediately afterwards, right? So I can inspect certain things. Uh, in this case, uh, I'll explain this, I'm just running a shell command head here to just view the file, the CSV file. But in this cell, I have a Python code, right? When there's an error here because I needed to import those libraries and packages. So I run that and I see output, right? But in certain instances, what I was saying is um, certain things will not give you an output. Like if I run the import statements here, I'm not getting any output, it's fine, right? Um, and then you have fancy things like uh, if you go under kernel, you can, because this notebook has a whole bunch of things, perhaps what I might be interested in is rerunning everything. Like if, I'm, if, if this notebook is a representation of a project I was working on and I want to re-execute everything from top to bottom, all I do is, instead of individually running all the different cells, I go to kernel, and then I will say, restart and run all. And then this will run everything. I, I probably would, shouldn't do this because I know some things take a lot of time here. Right? Um, you can shut down, you can change kernels and fancy things here. You can insert new cells. I mean, this is trivial stuff. Uh, I hate someone sighing. I know it's trivial stuff, but uh, OK. It makes life a lot easier, by the way, uh, notebooks. <clears throat> okay, uh, and then when it comes to content, right? Remember I s we say the different types of textual content that will probably come across is text, uh, visuals, and uh, live code. So for textual content, it turns out that, and we're in luck, uh, if you ever want to work with this, it's Markdown, right? So if you've edited Wikipedia before, no problem. If you, you use those funny, fancy formatting in WhatsApp, like underbar, text underbar, so that it's, it's in italic or, uh, or asterisk, asterisk, and then text so that it's bored, that's Markdown, right? It's trivial stuff, it's just like HTML, actually. You're looking at structure of the content, right? So uh, for the most part, I mean, what you'd have is like something similar to what I have here. Like if you're trying to describe the process, right? You write down the content on top there. Um, and write it down in Markdown. So this would be like a link, right? Hyperlink. This would be, uh, it would be an, a, a what? An ordered list, right? This would be paragraph. This would be heading one, right? <clears throat> so this is it. It's simple stuff, really. Uh, I don't think Markdown is different. You'd probably be able to, if you haven't worked with Markdown, if you read it up, the mind is quite small. Tonight you'll know Markdown, right? Uh, so if you are wanting an ordered an, an ordered list, this is what you do. Um, I know this is boring. So ordered list, right? Simple stuff. Uh, the Python code, though, I guess, is somewhat slightly different. So once we get through with Python, you realize that um, the same things that you'd normally write in uh, a, a Python module, a dot py, py file, a dot py file, are the same things that you put here, right? That same code. It's just like copy pasting. Right. The shell commands are somewhat different though, um, because what you have to do is you prefix them with um, an exclamation mark. So if you're working on Linux and you are wanting to run ls, for instance, it has to be exclamation mark and then ls. Uh, and really you realize that that's important, especially once you're going through the exploratory data analysis phase, because it's not always the case that you'd be working with fancy things like pandas. In certain instances, if you remember the examples I showed us, which was somewhere uh, 
here I guess uh, here I'm trying to, I mean, uh, before I import this, before I, I, impo I, I use uh, the pandas library here, I'm just trying to make sure that the data I'm working with uh, makes sense. So I do a sneak preview of that, and I can run fancy, other fancy uh, commands, like I want to see, uh, what I did here, no such file. Tell. I want to see the last couple of lines there. I don't know if that thing came up. Can't see. Well, I shouldn't have done that, it's taking long. But the bottom line is the same commands, the same shell commands that you are used to are the ones you run here. Um, and it turns out I think there are magics that are, uh, there are commands that are associated with bash that you can access as well if you're using Windows, right? That's besides the point. I don't know why this is taking long, though. <clears throat> the key thing, though, is when you're running these show commands, you just prefix the command with an exclamation mark. Uh, and then there are also cell magics that you might be interested in. Um, I'm not sure uh, in what instances. Like, if you want to integrate HTML, for instance, there's an HTML magic, and what you do is you use two percentage signs, right? So. To give you an idea of the sort of magics that are available out there, I will cancel this kernel. Uh, restart and <coughs> right. So these are the different um, magics that I have access to. Right. I don't know if HTML is here. I can't see HTML here. I wanted to use HTML as an example. Okay, there we go. Um, let's see if I'll be able to do something here. So if I want to... I wonder if this will work. I hope it does work. Ooh, no. I don't know why it's not working. Right, so it's supposed to be on a new line. So uh, all these different things that are here, uh, the magics that you could probably use. A useful, probably a useful thing that you're going to find yourself using is the time it, right? So if you're trying to, um, you're executing some command and you're trying to measure how long it's going to take the execution itself. You time it the first time, and then you time it at, at the end here. And then you have a sense of how long it takes, right? Um, I don't know which other magics I've used here, but fancy things, anyway. Besides the point. Um, and then the visuals, uh, for the most part, the visuals, I mean, visualizations can be done in HTML. Uh, so because you can run HTML code, you can literally make reference to an image source out there, right, and integrate it into here. But the visualizations that we're going to end up using here are the graphs. And the way we generate graphs is we'll predominantly use Python by taking advantage of matplotlib, right? So this is generated by matplotlib. These are the things that we're going to look at. This is important for us because once we look at evaluation, we want to be able to generate those uh, uh, fancy visualizations like uh, confusion matrices, right? The confusion matrix, um, uh, the rock caves, right? To, to try and figure out which of the linear algorithms is superior, right? So, but you get to, to put all those different things into this component here. All right, uh, I hope this was okay as the crash course introduction. Do you think we can, uh, instead of installing Jupyter Notebook, there, there's there, these instructions here, we don't have time to do that. But do you think that maybe as I'm running us through this Python thing, there are some exercises in here, but do you think maybe we can, in the process as we're doing this, we can attempt to, to do this uh, so that we're able to follow through with examples, because it turns out most of the things that I'm talking about here, we can do using Google Collaborator or Google Collab. So you, uh, I do encourage you to, hmm. <clears throat> so Jupyter and no, Google Collab can be used to run the Python commands? Yes, so both the shell scripts and the Python commands. Thank you for that question. Uh, so if I go to collab.google.research.com like so, 
And let me just connect to the internet here. I'll be able to do the same things I was doing using Jupyter Notebook Classic. Um, I'll be able to do the same things. So, one of the things that I've benefited from myself in the past uh, when learning these things is uh, uh, captive, being a captive audience where you are forced to do things, right? Not really forced, but you at least attempt to do some, some things. It's, at least you, you don't have an excuse to put things off here. So I think it would be nice if we play along with this as we are looking at Python. It won't help if we just uh, say... No, which is why I think the installation will waste time. So we can just connect to the internet and then go to callup.google.com. Um, so maybe we can do this together uh, as a first simple exercise so that as we are running through this Python code, we, we are on the same page. So uh, perhaps I will end up sharing a number of things. Can I suggest that you... You go here, please. Uh, so if you go to, and I'll share this just now. There we go. I'll be sharing uh, most of the links here. So just go here for now. Uh, I think that should be able to work, I hope. Because as we're working on some of these things, maybe uh, some people would want to share with us what they've worked on, so we we'll use this. It's just it's an Etherpad installation. This is a collaborative editor. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so something else I wanted to mention is uh, don't, don't get uh, too excited with it. It's good to be excited with implementation, but it turns out the idea is more important than the the implementation. So when we're looking at these things, right, it's what we're looking at is not really hardcore. There's nothing complex with the programming we are doing, right? Most, most of it. So uh, we must focus on these uh, fundamental ideas we are discussing. I don't know if we've managed to get there. If we have, we should be able to find, uh, start sharing some of the things. Um, So just go here and then you'll find most of the things that I'll be sharing there as well, including the link to Google Collaborator, although you can easily Google it up. Right? Uh. <clears throat> so I don't know if you've managed to set up the Google Collab thing and, yeah? Okay, so once you do that, you should be able to see something like this, right? Um, so uh, as a starting point, just click new notebook. Uh, and then you should be presented with um, uh, a new notebook. So if, if you have uh, an installation, once you install your, your Jupyter notebook, what you can do is there's an option for you to import an existing notebook, right? Uh, so what you would do is you work offline using Jupyter Notebook Classic like I have been doing, and then within Google Colab, I would import that notebook. And then it's saved, it's like you're saving, just like we save files on, in Google Drive, right? Uh, another interesting thing about what we are doing when you're working in the cloud is, like for me at least, because I have unlimited, and the people from CICT know this, I don't know if this is still the case here, but unlimited storage access. I normally dump a lot of large files here, so it makes it a lot easier to work, to work here, right? Because, lo and behold, I have, where are you? Is it because I'm not a, uh, uh, I think it's connecting to runtime enabled files. So I can import uh, data files from Google Drive from within here. Right, so you can create buckets essentially, which is quite nice. <clears throat> okay, so if we've done this then, uh, we'll start just to test that this thing works. Maybe we can, before we start our introduction of Python, the, the uh, tradition is always hello world, right? So in Python, the, there's, there's no system to allow to print. All you do is you just type in print in parentheses, because we're working with Python 3 here, so you can mount your drive, you see that. Uh, as a text, hello world. All right, with a, an exclamation mark. And the way you execute, I, I do hope uh, the same thing, shift, enter, right, and then boom, hello world, right? Uh, and also there's a repo, right, uh, a repel, 
so you can uh, you can execute uh, mathematical expressions within the print statement itself. Uh, so the hello world should be a nice introduction, I guess, before we dive into the Python. It should be straightforward. All right, so if we've, we've done that, then we know that the setup is fine and we're able to follow through with some of the things I'm going to be talking about so we can proceed with this thing. Good stuff. <clears throat> Okay, so this is going to be it, and some of these things I will skip, like the installation and setup, because we've already we are using Google Colab. But for you might want to visit this. Not, that, I'm thinking I'm talking with other people here, but I'm sure you'll figure out how to install Python anyway. <coughs> we'll just go through these basics and the different data structures, the things that we're going to use the most, right? Flow control and you know functions and modules, so how you import things and how you use things that you've imported. That's the most important thing. So we just gloss over this. Um, I always start with this, right, uh, so-called Zen of Python. If you do an import this, you'll find this really nice uh, printout about Python, motivation for why Python is nice, right? Uh, some rules, you know. <coughs> So it's, it's an interpreted language, obviously, similar to the likes of JavaScript and Perl, right? So meaning that when you write your code, you have to make sure that whoever you're shipping the code to has an interpreter. So um, I'm not sure if the Python interpreter has become synonymous to, to um, the JVM. And I'm making reference to Windows here. Uh, on Linux, when you install, at least the distros that I've worked with, when you install them, you almost always have Python installed there, right? It's mostly a scripting language, but obviously people have done a lot of useful things with it beyond scripting. So there are frameworks like Django that um, enable people to build web applications. Uh, I know someone who was obsessed with the Plow and content management system. I never could have understand. Never could understand why. Right? Why are you installing Plow? But so it's also general purpose, right? Perhaps that explains why it's very popular. And then it's an object-oriented programming language. We are going to be using, if you want to follow through with what I'm doing, I'm going to be using Python version 3, and specifically the version of Python I'm going to be using is, I, I don't really expect uh, there to be any mishaps, it's 3.6.9. So if you want to be able to replicate some of the things, if you don't want to run into problems, you must make sure that you're running 3.6.9. <clears throat> but, but I think uh, any version of 3, even the most recent one, 3.8, should be fine. Um, Right, so because it's interpreted, what you can do is you can actually write within the interactive, the, the interactive prompt itself, you can, you can actually execute the commands, um, which is why we're able to do that in Google Colab, right? Uh, but once you install Python, you can just run it on the command. You just run Python and then you will be presented with uh, um, an interactive interface like this, Python 3, where you can do the same thing. So once you install your Python, print hello world and then you do the same thing that we're doing in Google Colab. If you wish, what you can do is, uh, because it's a scripting language, you can create a script, csc 5741.py, by convention it's .py, then we, in here I'll just say print <coughs> hello world. Save this, of course you'd have the shebang there, and then I'll say Python 3 and then boom, hello world comes up as well, right? So it doesn't matter how you're doing because the scripting language can do fancy things. In fact, the modules that you download, right, uh, using PIP for instance, you'll find them somewhere as modules.py files. Uh, you must tell me if this is stuff that we've already done so that we focus on the more important things, right? <coughs> uh, if you want to download the, the if you're not, if you're using Windows, I guess you go here, right? But I know all I'd have to do here is sudo apt-get install Python 3, and then that's it, boom. Um, and I don't know about, I don't know about the Windows installation process, if you also install um, the easy installer, so the, 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 the thing that 
the module that's going to enable you to do this, pip install. Is it pip? So the, the, for me, most of the, it's pip install. So when I'm installing packages, I use a uh, pip command. Uh, I'm not sure if it comes by default when you install Python on Windows. So if you're using Linux, but you do the same thing, so pip install matlab, for instance, matplotlib, not matlab, right? <coughs> Uh, the, obvious, the other obvious question once you set up this is people will say, but what IDE, right? Uh, my, the mother of all IDEs for me, but not an IDE really, a text editor that I've been using for years is called Kate. It comes integrated with uh, uh, Kubuntu or KDE desktop environment. Um, but if you go to Stack Overflow, you find uh, people with their own opinions on what is uh, the best IDE to use. Right, or what is the best idea to, to, to use here? I don't know which one is the best. For the developers in the house, I recently discovered, because I've, I've actually gravitated more towards um, Visual Studio Code, I recently discovered that there's a really nice plugin called Python, it's developed by Microsoft. Really nice, IntelliSense is integrated within this, right? So, uh, observe, if I just say make CSC 5741, and then I'll move CSC, put Py into CSC. Oops, sorry. So uh, if, I, if I'm working on a Python command, because I have IntelliSense here, <coughs> I, I don't have to worry about, oh, uh, what if I don't know the command? I have this, right? And then uh, it, it actually makes you more productive, and if you can see here. Uh, so if you are a, a software developer who uh, has, zoom, out, zoom in, control eco sign, who has, uh, <clears throat> who has gravitated towards Visual Studio Code because everybody's using Visual Studio Code these days, really nice. Um, I think there's another plugin that I've come across which allows you to see what you're doing in real time. So as you're typing the commands, the output appears on the right panel. A, uh, is it A? R E P L or something. So look it up if you want. Uh, what I normally do because most of the scripting I do is like it, it, less than 100 lines of code. So in in some instances I'll use this a lot. Right? It doesn't matter. Use V I or Vim if you want. Right? But take your pick. Whatever tickles your fancy is fine. Right? It doesn't matter here. We're not trying to start a, an IDE or a text editor war here. But this is quite nice. Right? What I like is I also discovered when I was looking up. Uh, Visual Studio Code, because I was interested. Now that I'm using Visual Studio Code, can I use Python here? Turns out you can actually even view Python notebooks in here. So you have one interface where you can do everything, right? You can create your, your, your modules and then you can test them right within here, if you're interested. Uh, I don't know how many people have used Visual Studio Code. The, oh, yeah, the developers in the house, yeah. Uh, anyway, but. Right, I mean, so there's nothing like uh, explicitly uh, specifying the data type associated with the variable, nothing like int, x, whatnot, x is equal to two. I mean, Python knows that it's an integer. x is equal to 2.5, right? But, but the thing that really puts off most people is uh, indentation is, is, is important. So as you're writing code, like if you're in a for loop, once you write that for loop, um, full colon at the end, and I'll talk about this, and then you have to indent the code. And the indentation has to be consistent. If you're using two spaces, it has to be two spaces throughout. So it's a tab, it's a tab, right? Uh, this is the same as syntax, I don't know what I was thinking here. Um, uh, and then, I mean, some obvious things that maybe, if, especially if you're getting started for the first time, things that you want to look out for here is uh, things to do with uh, uh, syntax associated with identifiers, right? So it's case sensitive, obviously. Um, so if, if your variables have different casing, then as far as Python is concerned, um, these are different variables. Um, these are two different variables. Uh, 
there's a convention that is followed, right? So you can use a combination of, you can only use a combination of letters, numbers, and underbars, right? You cannot have uh, an exclamation mark as a variable. It's syntax error, right? Uh, and I wonder if you can start with a number here. Just, but these are things, as you're starting off, these are things that you, so x12 is equal to five is correct. Is 12x correct? No, right? So a combination of, of these, but you can't start with a number. So you can start with an underbar or a letter, right? But you cannot start with uh, a number. Um, and then there are a number of uh, Python reserved words. Uh, I think I should have a slide that shows the number of reserved words. Last time I checked, they were what? Somewhere at 50 or something. So you can't use those as, uh, as uh, variables, right? No, no. If, and, right? Um, and of course the assignment operator is the equal sign here, like I showcased there. Right, so uh, if, you, if you go to your interpreter and you just key in uh, keyword dot um, uh, KW list. Let me see if my recent version of um, why isn't this working? Let me just. Oh, there we go. Um, so all of these things that you have here cannot be used as uh, as variable names, right? Uh, and I mean, I guess in, in most instances, the error message that comes up should be very, um, very informative, so it shouldn't be a problem. Um, and then, so you have block uh, uh, comments that, uh, well, Block comments and then uh, with a block and inline comments and also I think doc comments. Um, so uh, inline comments and block comment we use the pound sign, right? So if you want a comment on top of a statement, you use this. Uh, if you want an inline comment like that, you use that character as well. Uh, you also have these doc comments. Uh, and, and really these, these things, uh, what you see when you, you issue, let's say, the, is it the help command, the help built-in command or the DIR command, uh, the description of the module that you're working with. Um, um, but also it, it helps you define like a, a multi-line comment, right? If you don't want to use the number of pound signs. So what I mean by the documents that you see is if you say the help is it keyword or something, right? This thing here. Is it this or DIR? Not this. Maybe help to this. So the, doc the documents that you write uh, is what would, would come up here when someone issues, uh, issues uh, the help command so that they see what the, is it the class or the module is all about, right? And the way you do that is uh, you use either single quotes, three of them, then you close them off with three single quotes, or three double quotes, you close them off with three double quotes. <clears throat> um, and then in terms of data types, uh, uh, ah, you, like I said, I mean, you don't need to explicitly state the data type. It's nothing like this is an int x, right? You just come up with a variable and then assign it a value, and then it knows. When Python sees a uh, quote, it knows it's a string. It sees uh, an integer value like this, it knows it's an int. Um, when it sees um, a float value, um, floating point value, then it knows that it's a float, a double. Um, when it sees, uh, is it uh, something like true or something, then it, it knows that this is It knows that it's a Boolean value, right? So, so Python knows this. So I, I could. So no, there's no need to declare this. So, 5.4. I wonder if this is double float, float, right? And then you can cast some of these things if you want to. And really, casting uh, perhaps becomes important when you're working with uh, certain types of data structures. 
uh, I, I know that uh, some data structures have properties where you can only find unique values in there. So you might want to convert a list into a set, um, perhaps do some, some sort of processing where you create a dictionary based on a list that you have, right? Um, I guess these are the most important things that you'd ha have to pick out, especially once, once we start looking at uh, exploratory data analysis. But, uh, so the data, data types there. Yeah, string. Uh, there's, there's this, uh, I don't know if people have come across the developers in the house, the string wall, right? Do we use single quotes or double quotes? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it depends, right? I don't know, by convention, which one do you follow? Uh, in the, uh, it depends. When, like, in my case, if I'm doing um, stuff on the DB, I use single quotes. Yes. Um, um, on the, on the uh, court side, yeah. I use the double quote. Yeah. If you Google up, this is, there's, there's a number of interesting write-ups on Stack Overflow, you know, people trying to defend, we should use single quotes. It's a, the things we do in life sometimes, but anyway. As long as it works. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> I don't know. Is it working? Sorry? I think the question is, are you doing it the right way? Is it necessary to do what you're doing? Right. So I'll give an example. I think I said it last time. Eh? People would talk about an egg. If you yeah. break an egg using a hammer, it right. will break. Yeah. You can use a spoon, it will break. Right. But which one is more efficient? Why should you use a hammer to break an egg? Right. That's what egg it is. <laughs> 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 it could be a lot of Or a dinosaur egg, right? Yeah. It's frozen somewhere in Siberia <laughs> or something. It depends. Yeah. yeah. If you put single words, it shows people how to move. <laughs> yeah, there's always this question of how do you represent, uh, how do you represent I'm happy, right? Like if this is a string. These are things, yeah, these are, but I'm just saying, it's, uh, some, some, some people would, uh, you know, just saying, some people would just say, well, but we can, we can still escape it, but, yes. but anyway, uh, let's not, uh, <laughs> When you're talking to computer scientists, this is what they do. But, okay, so the, the, other, the other data types like Boolean values here. Um, there. An interesting thing about Boolean values that I want to mention is, and these are tricks that you might want to, I think, uh, take advantage of, right? Um, I think Python has this notion of, just like JavaScript, this notion of falsy and truthy values, right? So, Look at this, right? Uh, Forcey and truthy values, just something is. I don't know if people are able to know. So uh, what I'm saying is, uh, there's certain certain uh, values of different data types could be considered false or truthy values, right? Um, so an empty list is. Forcey, right? Because empty list and force is. Oh, this is this is. Is this uh, it's supposed to be true, right? This is interesting. I don't know what point I was trying to prove here, but this, there's something not working here. Let's. This is homework for us to discover why this is happening. <laughs> let's 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 do this. I hope I didn't uh, miss. So, I don't know about the other data structures, but I do know that uh, when it comes to zero and one here, it works, right? Because zero is false, anyway, but I'm just saying. Uh, Yeah, I guess it works now, right? Uh, so if I cast uh, an empty string to, if I cast an empty string to Boolean value, uh, that works. I don't know why this is not, work, the other one is not working. I don't know if you see what I'm doing here. If I cast uh, a Boolean value with a value five here and, and, uh, and, and spit out X, yeah? Because it has a value, right? But I don't know why this is not working. This, this is, 
an enigma, right? This is supposed to be... It's supposed to be true. Force is equal to force, I don't know. But <laughs> anyway, okay. So these are things that maybe you might want to take advantage of as you are implementing these things. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, by the way, least turbo dictionary, right? Say, is it set? If it's empty, because it turns out that uh, uh, I think it should be, is it dictionary or set? It should be a set. Dictionary, okay. So it turns out that you represent sets, or we talk about these sets in the same way, uh, type X set, right? But when you have an empty thing that has uh, this parenthesis, this curry uh, brackets here, then it's, um, or the braces, then it's a dictionary, right? All right, and uh, so I don't know if there's a part where we talk about. Okay, there's the part where we talk about dictionary, which is supposed to be here. But anyway. Um, and then uh, also functions, right? Reusable code here. Um, very helpful, especially when you implement those modules, the .py files, right? And uh, the implementation is as simple as just. Uh, Specifying the function name, opening parenthesis, closing parenthesis, and then the full colon dictates that everything that follows below is the body. And then you come up with implementation in the body, right? So maybe you're just printing a string or something, or I'm trying to see if there's an example. There is an example. Um, invocation, uh, so the implementation would have um, uh, the, the function header, what is the function header? would have the name for it by a parenthesis if it doesn't take in any uh, arguments, full colon, and then what follows here is uh, the body of the function. There's an example afterwards. Then the way you evoke it is you just call the function name, and then if it takes in parameters, you feed it with an actual parameter. If it does not, then it's empty, and then you have an execution. So back to our hello world, right? Uh, fx, hello. Name, opening parenthesis, closing parenthesis, that, who? The spikes are also a predefined function. Sorry? The spikes are also a predefined function. Yes, built in functions. There's a DF keyword, by the way. They are, they are what they call built in functions, and I think there's a way, we'll look at built in functions just now, but what I'm saying is you start by the DF function definition keyword followed by the name of the function, uh, opening parenthesis, closing parenthesis, full colon. To say this uh, now comes the body, and then you indent it, and then you come up with uh, the actual code associated with the function. Let's say we wanted to print hello world, so print hello world, exclamation mark, boom, and then the moment you evoke this, then it will print the hello world, right? If it takes in arguments, um, hello world, uh, or function add, takes in arguments A and B, and what you do, one, two, three, four. I don't know why I do that. Uh, this is the tab versus space war. Yeah. Should we use tabs or should we use spaces? Right? I use spaces and I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed of myself. But uh, so I would say if, if you, you're returning a statement, if, if this thing returns uh, something, you just say return A plus B in this case because we are adding. And then once you call this with actual parameters, um, five plus seven, then you have 12. Interesting thing here, right? I mean, and I don't know if this happens in Java, right? I wonder if this, uh, it's not working, then it's a concatenation, mismatch of numbers. Okay, that's fine. I thought it was going to work because I don't think there's an implicit casting. <clears throat> but anyway, so, uh, you come up with implementation and then you call the function with the actual arguments, like so. Right. Uh, in this case, you are returning something. It could be the case that your function might not necessarily be returning anything at all. Oh, the, the question is answered. Right? The number of uh, built in functions, in fact, the type, I was, when I was checking the type of the variable is a built-in. I don't have to import any uh, modules, right, or packages. Um, I just call type function. I know int, I know set, um, list, these are all built-in functions. 
Is it? Yeah, least. Uh, yeah. Dict for dictionary. So these are all built ins. Um, all right. Uh, all right, and this is similar to what I just did here. And this would probably result in an. In an uh, in an error, I think, right? This is just my my fault because when I was creating this indentation, right? because uh, Python will think this is where it ends. You know? and it's like a long return statement. We're not actually supposed to be part of that. Um, you know, I mean, so there's things to do with all oh, default parameters that you can supply there, right? In the event that you evoke this with uh, one of the parameters missing, then it might get substitutes. But this is trivial stuff. I don't know if maybe we can maybe just pause and uh, I don't know if there was a uh, before we get to data structures. D do we think maybe we can just try and um, exercise a little here? I can continue talking, and maybe we can exercise a little by uh, what type of function can we create here? Let's. Um, <laughs> I don't know if people are interested here. Let's just see if we are able to. If you're all on the same page, except for the people that already know, I guess. Uh, okay, maybe let's finish everything else because what I was thinking about involves using uh, um, loops and conditional statements anyway. Yeah, but we haven't discussed conditional statements. It's fine, maybe let's proceed. I, I, was, I was looking at people's faces and I'm thinking maybe might be overdoing it by just continuing talking instead of this is best done uh, because the, the idea was to do most of the programming or the exercises when we look at the actual packages because that's where the most interesting things are so how do you import data how do you make data sets um, how do you generate graphs right not the trivial stuff but but somehow I feel there's something wrong with with this just talking about how functions and whatnot <laughs> wait but Sorry. Okay. okay. Let's let's see if we can. Yeah, but you'd still be using loops, right? Anyway, yeah. Let's print a function that prints numbers from from hundred to one. What uh, hints? Let's just do it, and then I'll, uh, the idea is I just want to walk around and see if if there's anyone that needs me to just point them out to something, especially if you've not used. Uh, oh, don't know if it's me. I just walked there and I walked back and it came up. Uh, if you haven't used Python, I can understand maybe some things are not exactly uh, intuitive here. So I can walk around as these people are implementing a function. Let's write a function that, um, write a function that prints the squares of numbers between zero and 100. Let's print, I don't know if, write a function that prints out one number at, at a time, the squares, right, mm -hmm. of numbers between 0 and 100. So 0 squared, 1 squared, 2 squared, 4 squared, no, so 0. Including 0 and 100. Yes, yeah. we can include 0 and 100. Here's a hint for us. We can, we can do help range if you want, help range. Uh, it will help you g get in the habit of, so just do help range. Range is an inbuilt function. Range will give you an idea of how to do this. If you just type in help range, it will show you what this. Is there anyone that needs me to, if, if maybe setting up Google call up or something, are we all comfortable? Okay. So if you can just, maybe just, maybe five minutes, let's see if we can come up with, this is, uh, it's like we're in first year. Uh, people have changed, right? The first years I worked in, in fact, second years, I think the quality has gone down, right? It's uh, shocking, actually. But I don't know what's going on here. But it's like we're in first year now. <clears throat> so if you do a help, if you just go to the Google Colab and you type, I think it should be able to spit out. What I mean is, if you just say help, Ah, range. Please work. If you don't, then I don't. There we go. So this will give you an idea of how to implement that. 
Actually, let's make it more fancy, right? <laughs> let's write a function that prints the squares of numbers between 0 and 100 only if they are even. But a range would be it's a giveaway. Yeah. It's, it's not like it's a, it's a complex. Sorry, I need to run. Yeah, no, that's fine. It's a, it's a Friday, right? <laughs> oh, remember again, which domain is that? Access Bank. Hmm, yeah, the banks, right? People want to draw money on a Friday here. I'm sure it'll be cold. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's a, <laughs> yeah, we'll see you on Tuesday. Thanks. Oh, all right. <laughs> <coughs> 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 Has anyone made uh, any headway? If you do, we'll ask you to please, uh, once you make some progress, we'd want you to share the source code via here. This is why I shared that so that we see, right? Uh, and really, most of what we're going to be doing is going to involve some aspects of looping and conditional statements, nothing complex, really, using data structures. And the beauty with, that's a, one of the beauty with, uh, with Python, really, you, you see how elegant it is. You can do so much in uh, using short line of code. Um, What did I say? It's a function that prints squares of numbers between 0 and 100. That are what? Forgotten. That are even. Oh, that are even. Thank you. <coughs> now, the, the English fanatics would kill us here. Why would you do that? Write a function that prints even, uh, that prints squares of even numbers between 0 and 100, and not what I've just done here, right? I mean, the English, the construction of the English is uh, horrible, but. Um, that's besides the point. So another hint, I guess, because we haven't looked at loops, is uh, the for statement. The syntax is uh, it's for the variable in, and then so you'd come up with something like if I want to print want uh, if I want to print uh, numbers that are in a list one, two, three, right? Um, and this list is x. I would say, sorry, this list is x. I would say for i in x print i, right? This is another thing because I haven't looked at uh, like just so the for statement, I guess, so two hints, maybe like a for statement and range. So, <clears throat> uh, I don't know if I have a link to, um, <clears throat> to Code Academy, but if you, uh, to, to the, to, well, if you've used, if you have, if you used Code Academy before, Code Academy has, um, a nice Python, Python tutorial is interactive. If you're not in the habit of, if, if you've, yeah, you've become a dinosaur like myself who prefers sometimes to do interactive tutorials than, than actually reading an entire book, right? Uh, so called Academy, and uh, I've discovered that I think they're, they're doing some massive marketing campaigns. So those, the premium courses that require you to be a professional, you can actually do them uh, by doing a test for seven days, so you can do a course for seven days for free that you'd pay money for. There's a Python 3 tutorial, really nice. The only free Python tutorial is Python 2, which you can do, by the way, but I guess the 3 is much better. Uh, also, in my links, as we are working on this, there's a, a book that uh, when I, uh, I used to be a temporary lecturer when I was a student, and I'll teach an introductory Python 
course and I know one of the recommended readings was always uh, a bite of Python. It's less than 100 pages. Really um, easy to follow so you'd be able to pick out most of the basics. I have it listed as one of the references. I do encourage you to do that. Has anyone made some progress? Some sort of, it's fine, just, we just want to see some uh, here maybe. I see there's, who is but to say, I, I thought, I don't know. I don't know who this is, but maybe, who is this? Have, have you done something? Maybe you can paste it there. Is it, <laughs> sorry. Well, whatever people have done, just paste it here. Just log into this location and we just want to see it. Even if they haven't even run it yet? Yeah, well maybe, okay, run it. I just, I'm looking at the time, sorry. But it's fine. Uh, also, by the way, some of the hints, right, uh, and I'm talking as a documentation. I, I, I don't know how many of the developers in the house. I, I use Zeo myself for offline documentation. So as we're working with most of these things, so uh, Python 3, I, I have offline manuals here. Uh, Zeo is quite nice. I really like it. Markdown, if you, you, you want to work through the text part of um, Jupyter Notebooks, right? So I love Zeo. You can actually download a number of document sets. Actually, it's not just... Uh, um, it's just this, but so just saying. But otherwise, these days, I mean, people normally have access to the internet, so you can always read the online documentation. I'm just saying, so Zeo is quite nice. <clears throat> but other than that, I mostly what I do myself when I'm working with Python is just either DIR and whatever help I need, or help and something that I want to find out help. On. That always works. Um, that way I don't have to shift context going somewhere else. Not like it. I know I think it's because we, have, we haven't discussed loops and, and uh, range. Write a function that prints the squares of, I should rewrite this because we're recording this even numbers between zero and instead of square numbers between that are even, this is the wrong English, much better. <coughs> Not like it. So maybe we should look at this together, right? Yes. You have something. Yeah. Do, do you want to dump, just dump it here and then we'll correct it together? I think it's. Oh, okay. Uh, do you have Wi-Fi? That machine doesn't have Wi-Fi. Oh, do you want to connect to my Wi-Fi hotspot? But Okay, I can come and look at what you've done. I wanted to beam it there, but so that everybody sees, but it's fine. <coughs> no, it's fine. Okay. Why can't you connect to the internet? I wanted everybody to see this. Can't you connect? Uh. <coughs> One plus three T. <coughs> password. password. I know I feel stupid, but it's password. <laughs> <laughs> okay, join. Um, so, okay, um, then let's just go to, uh, can you copy this? Yeah, can, are you able to copy it? Okay. 
oh, it's a Mac, right? I was wondering why it looks different. Uh, and then let's just go to the internet and then open up. Uh, so go to list.unza.zm, so list.unza.zm. Ah, so you wonder, I had a discussion about, uh, about Libgen, right? I saw it come up there. Oh. I saw you. I, <laughs> I had a class today and uh, we had a philosophical discussion about um, uh, Aaron Schwartz and how he committed suicide and whatnot after he leaked those journals from JSTOR. And I was trying to, to hear the, the third year's thoughts and they looked at me strange, I guess. I, they, so I just stopped the discussion. Um, this is fine, I guess. <laughs> but I see you spend time on Libgen and then just paste it there. Okay, so there's this implementation here, right? Uh, I see is is uh, using if here. I don't know if people can can spot. Uh, so what, what flaws can we notice already here? If we are saying the square of, uh, is, does this work just fine? No. Sorry. Well, I don't know if we remember equivalence tests and what, what not, but in the, I don't know if this is unit testing, but, but uh, let's, let's do this. Um, maybe let's look at the output together, right? So actually, let's use Jupyter Notebooks instead of the terminal, the console. So we shall go here and uh, we shall say there's that, and then there's a... Uh, J times two, and then there's uh, this if statement that checks if. Um, I, I, I'm glad. I mean, you use the range anyway, which is fine, but you probably didn't check for um, for a part. This is interesting, right? What is the square of? Uh, okay, this is. What is the square of, I mean, I mean, I guess it would work if you just replace the 20 by, uh, because we said numbers have to be between zero and 100, right? Um, this is fine, I mean, uh, different strokes here. But, but, but really, I mean, what, what I was, uh, uh, <clears throat> what I, I thought people would do is if you look at range, right, the range has a, it should have a step function. Also, I mean, so if if you're print, if you're checking for numbers between zero and one hundred, I mean, you we have we not missed out some here? We have, right? Um, but anyway, so another way of looking at this is uh, <clears throat> uh, where is the step thing here? Because range is different, you see this? The optional parameter at the end, start, stop, comma, step. So the step is, uh, the default step is one, you're stepping by one, so what you can do is tell it to say step by two, so that your range is going to have, um, well, so you just say four, i in range uh, zero, 100. Step by two, say print, for starters, I mean, let's just try and see if it's going to print all the even numbers between that range, which it does, right? Um, uh, and of course, I mean, you can easily fix this because 100 is not being printed here because the last number is not printed, so you can just plus one or something, whatever, doesn't matter. But once you print these out, all you have to do is, instead of i, you just say i, I times i, and then you'd have your, because these are even numbers, right? The, the, the trick was just, I was trying to see if people would use the help range. Because once you, you and, and this is what you want to get in the habit of doing if you're working with something you're not very familiar with. Once you read the help, it will show you the different, like in this case, it shows you to say, um, this is the syntax there. Uh, but this was good, I suppose, a very nice um, 
exercise? Could we leave the question again? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's the definition of the question. Write a function that prints the squares of even numbers. So I thought we were printing only the even square numbers between 0 and 100. As in you do this. Oh, oh, you thought, uh, okay, maybe it was, uh, okay, semantics. Okay, that's fine. Okay, the even square numbers. Okay. Sorry, this, this, oh, the even square numbers. But is this, uh, okay, I see what you mean. Is there a square, is there, is there a, uh, that's, sorry, that's not even. Sorry? Oh, yes, of course, okay, they're there. Okay, that's fine. Oh, that's why you had, uh, you were talking about the module operator, right? Okay, that's fine. Oh, this is fine as well. It doesn't matter, we're just trying to see if four would be here in range. In fact, I wanted to, uh, it's a, it's, it was a way of me trying to say you want to develop a habit of if you don't know how a particular functional module works, help or DIR. It will, it will be very helpful. And also, in, um, in this thing called uh, Google Colab, things like question mark, right? I mean, I guess question mark something else. It will come up with a number of interesting things here. We want to develop the habit of doing this. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so it was telling me 20, so maybe we can quickly do a couple of more things before we do this. So another important thing that we're going to use a lot here, these key data structures here, right? So in Python, the core data structures in the data structures are tuples, lists, and dictionaries, and sets, right? Um, and, and I guess the takeaway point, I don't know if there's an explanation for this, probably not, but the takeaway point here is uh, there are some data structures that are mutable, some of them are not mutable. Like if you have a tuple that has these values, you cannot modify that, right? So these are things to keep in mind. And because of that, obviously, a data structure like a tuple is much more efficient than a list. So if you're on the hunt for um, efficiency, you want to make sure that you use the correct data, data structure. Um, certain data structures will take in, uh, I think, different data types. I can't remember which one. Let's look at these things I'm talking about. So I'm saying x is equal to a tuple which has four and two. I don't know what I'm doing here, why this is going off. Um, so there's, there's no way of saying, uh, uh, there's no way of adding something to x, right? I don't know if I'm making sense here. You cannot, you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot, and I guess a nice way of doing this is doing this, right? You cannot mutate it by saying the value at index zero is going to be eight instead of four. It's immutable, right? But when you're working with a list, right? Same contents, but a list, you can change it. That's what I'm saying. Right, these are things to think about. And for certain data structures, I don't know if it's a tuple, can you have one and string x? Yes, but how about a list? And these are things that you want to think about. Oh, yes, uh, I think all of them then, right? Perhaps it's sets, I think. For sets, oh, it works as well. I don't know what I was thinking here. Anyway, I'm probably misrepresenting different languages here. So it turns out that you, you know these different data sets, type tuples, um, uh, lists and dictionaries can have uh, a variation of different data types, right? So you can have integers and strings combined into one of these data, into one data structure. It doesn't necessarily have to be composed of the same, um, same uh, the variables of the same data type. Um, so, I mean, if you're, in, if you're working on a problem that involves uh, making reference to key value pairs, and you see this a lot once we start working with pandas data frames, so you want, you probably might, you uh, come, come across use cases where you want to use a unique identifier and map it to a value, right? You'd use a dictionary, key value pairs. So a dictionary is one of those data structures that uh, is represented by key value pairs, a key and the corresponding value. Uh, you use the key to reference the value as opposed to index here. Um, what else is worth talking about in here? Yeah, it's just about it. Uh, uh, some, some other weird things that you come across is observe. Uh, you cannot, yeah, I don't know if you notice what just happened here. Uh, the set only 
includes unique values of items. So if you have duplicates like this, they're merged into one. And uh, I, again, you come across use cases where you'd want this, right? Um, I, I do this a lot when I'm, I, I guess, uh, like I'm trying to find, uh, what? I'm trying to think of a unique case here. I'm working with a list and I know it has duplicates, but I want to have a list that does not have duplicates, right? All I do is I just, I will say, uh, observe, if this is, boom, if this is a list, x type x is a list, right? And x has duplicates, all I'll do is I'll say list, uh, I'll say x is equal to set x, right? And x now has duplicates. And in fact, I can again mutate x and just say x is equal to uh, list x, right? And then I have this. And in fact, if you look at what, what I just did here, right? I could just say, well, if I want, if I have a, a duplicate of of x's like so, why, why not just say, uh, I want x to be, to have unique values, so I'll just say set x, and then just say call list on on this set x, right, instead of doing it separately, right? So um, this high, whole notional idea of chaining functions is quite common. Um, again, I will draw you to the Zen, right? Uh, where is that? Simple is better than complex. Uh, I wonder if there's a Zen that is to do with that. I can't see it here, but anyway. I guess this is beautiful to me anyway, but, sorry? Oh yes, simple is better than complex, right. So your, your list would be an array actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, in Python at least. Okay, uh, so here's a question, right? Do we think that we've got into a stage where if we see uh, so my interest is the reason I, I decided to integrate this is once we start looking at some examples, um, my, my goal is to make sure that when we start walking through, because to cut down on time, I rarely, I tried this the first couple of sessions last time where I'll do, we'll do the implementation together, write the code together, but we're wasting time, right? So what I started doing is I'll implement the notebook come with it here and then we execute it to see what's happening behind the scenes and then I share the notebooks with you, you play around with them and modify them, right? My goal for doing this is to make sure that once I bring a notebook and I'm walking us through the theory and the practical, you are able to understand these things. Of course, we haven't finished some of these things. You see, you see these things, you should be able to understand what's going on. That's why I'm, we are going through this process, right? Um, and also more importantly, for the mini project, right? Um, you want to be able to already come up with implementation. By the way, the topics will be ready by um, next week, so be on the lookout. Okay, uh, this problem has started again. I don't know why this is happening, but <clears throat> let's maybe finish off uh, uh, this, and then it looks like the part to do with uh, pandas and matplotlib. We can integrate it together with exploratory data analysis next next week. So we'll have a a brief introduction and then immediately dive into the EDA process, which is data, is, it, is that data preparation or data understanding? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> right, so, I mean, loops, I think we've already looked at this. The key thing with Python, right, the thing that really uh, confuses beginners with Python is the indentation and this funny thing. There are no uh, explicit statement terminators here, sorry, right? Um, so these, these are things that, uh, that you usually, it can be a pain actually, when you're doing this for the first time. But once, once you familiarize with yourself with Python, you will really grow to love it, I assure you. Maybe, hopefully by the end of this uh, course you will do that. And I, I, I remember this one time someone had asked, but for the mini projects, can we use uh, Java? And I laughed, but, but yes we can. But I, I, I was reminding him to say if you look up online on most widely used languages when it comes to machine learning. Java is not on the list, right? You probably find tutorials on R, maybe MATLAB or something, but for the most part it's Python, right? What I'm trying to say is you're not restricted to any implementation. If you're comfortable with R, I do encourage you to use R, right? 
which is nice. I only use R for statistical analysis and uh, visualizations. I do not use it for machine learning. I use Python machine learning. Um, I'm not the only one. But the other thing really is this whole notion of modules, right? Um, so if you have a library that uh, someone has implemented, like we will start, soon start using Pandas and Scikit-Learn and, uh, and uh, also Matplotlib, how exactly do you use those things in your code? Can't remember what we do in Java, but in Python, we use import statements. And there's two ways of importing libraries or packages or modules, right? Either you, do, you, you use the import keyword followed by the name of the library or mode you want to import, or use from followed by the package and then the specific mode you want to import. The difference here is just that um, when, you, when, you import, when you import something using the import statement, what that means is you have to explicitly use the package name, so math dot, what you're interested in. So in this example, if we want to compute the square root of a number, like, uh, well, nine, is it nine, right? We cannot say SQRT, we will have to first of all import math, and then say math dot SQR, and then say nine. If you're okay with this, it's a, again, we don't want to start a war here, but it's a matter of test. If you're okay with the dot notation, that is fine. I sometimes use it myself. But if you want to be more elegant and you want to cut down on time, you can just say from math, import the explicit module, which is SQRT. And then what you do there is you don't need to um, explicitly use the dot operator, right? So from and import, from x, import and import. Sometimes you might want to import everything, import, uh, or from math, import everything, asterisks. If you're working on a math problem, and you see this a lot in, uh, I guess, Matplotlib or something. So from math, get everything. And then you have access to everything you want. Right. Um, uh, this will come up a lot. Like if you look at what I have in this notebook, for me to be able to use most of the things here, like. Uh, uh, if I'm doing text processing, I obviously have to use NLTK, right? Um, I gain access to a stemmer here if I'm trying to stem those things. Remember the preprocessing task we spoke about. Uh, <clears throat> if I want to gain access to specific learning algorithms, I of course need to use the scikit-learn uh, library, right? For within that library, there are a number of modules, right? Um, so yeah, but the key thing here is you just need to know how to import things. Because we already know the other important thing, how to read the manual to understand how to access the different modules within that library, right? Because for you to know that uh, uh, if you, you, you want to access the TFIDF vectorizer, for instance, you must know, and how you know, you must know that from SKLN, this is where you import it, and you're only able to know this if you have access to the manual, right? Zero, or the online help documentation should, should be able to suffice. But it's just the importing, right? When you're importing modules that you're interested in. And the, 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 for when it comes to Python, really, you rarely do, it's at least insofar as machine learning is concerned, you rarely do anything new, right? You are reusing things that already exist. Irrespective of the type of machine learning problem you're working towards, clustering, um, uh, regression, you know, uh, classification, there's already implementations out there. Right? All you have to do is run experiments to find which implementation is better, and then you, 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 you just state that you went through this process where you empirically ran some experiments and determined that uh, perhaps SVM was better or something. <coughs> oh, and I had a square root here. <coughs> okay, so maybe uh, we can continue the math plot stuff, or we can graph some if you want. But I think Mr. Zul is about to leave. It's almost 20. Um, so we'll continue the, uh, the pandas part. It's a short one. And pandas and uh, mat, mat, uh, mat with lib. Um, and then we'll start looking at the EDA process. We'll mostly do some text processing. I have a number of data sets. Uh, maybe something to think about if um, 
if you don't want us to work on student results, and um, I, I extracted a post from Zambian Watchdog and Lusaka Times for the year, tw actually, for most of them is dating back, uh, and I'm recording this, but it's illegal. Facebook doesn't allow that. But I, I scrapped um, data from Zambian Watchdog and Lusaka Times. These are just posts, not comments. The comments are only for a selected uh, post that had a number of reactions, right? the largest number of reactions. So we can, we can use that as an example. So what I'm trying to say is I have certain data sets but if you want us to use the classic data sets that most of these tutorials use, which come uh, together bundled with scikit-learn, we can do that. I always like, uh, if you look at last year's examples, we are working with uh, JCTR, uh, student results, um, can't remember what else we used, and the idea was to work on, I guess, data sets that are closer to home. And for me, really, it's like killing multiple beds with one stone, because as we're working on these, I, we get to create some data sets that might be useful perhaps, I don't know. So, but think about this, uh, maybe we can use both, or maybe we can go with the standard uh, data sets in, uh, we will look at flowers or something. Have you looked at uh, Doc CEO? Maybe we can use Doc CEO before we go here. <laughs> the developers, you know Doc CEO, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a surprise here. Uh, oh, there we go. Dog.co. It's a nice data set of dogs or something, but um, so we can use this, I guess, as well. This would be nice uh, if you want. I don't know. <coughs> Dog.co. Crazy things here. Oh, um, have you? I don't know if I introduce this. This person does not exist. Maybe if you look at images, perhaps uh, you've heard about this. Apparently, all of these things that we are seeing here, right? These are um, randomly generated images. These people don't actually exist, right? So there's just um, a linear algorithm that does this. It, it creates faces. So every time you refresh, um, a new face comes up, a face that doesn't exist. And then the argument here is people, I mean, if you look up uh, discussions about this, there, there are certain people that feel like this is bad, right? You know what this means, right? You can automatically create profiles and all those funny things. Well, some people argue to say, I mean, you can, Maybe when it comes to marketing, if you're a company that does marketing, instead of using actual human beings, you can use like generated images like so. You know, so maybe these are things we can use, but the number of, um, yeah. I, I, I think that you're bound to find like distorted images because this thing randomly creates this. It's not perfect, right? So I, I think uh, maybe you'll find someone with an ear, I mean an ear that's here, but you understand what I mean, right? Um, but just out of curiosity, you're saying there are no few pictures, right? No. So I'm trying to figure out as to... Well, you have features. Your face has certain features. A human being has certain features that makes a human being, right? And so you just have to figure out what makes us different, look different. And then that's it. I mean, the distortion is what you work with. I mean, uh, so maybe also something we never discussed last time, but it came out in the paper, the issue of bias, right? One thing I've done, right, is um, if you if you do this, one thing you'll notice is the vast majority of these faces are what? White, yeah. Um, and people are talking a lot about these things, right? It's, it turns out that it's, it's one of those hot topics, right? Bias in, in AI. Uh, I don't know if you, you read up on a while back, uh, was that Google Photos? It classified a black person as a gorilla, right? Um, and, you know, people you know, started talking about But these are things to maybe discuss, maybe later on at some stage. If not, we we'll deliberately select papers that discuss those things, or things like explainable machine learning or something. But this is nice, anyway. These days, people are developing things that automatically write news, right? Um, all right, so maybe we can, we can call it a night, and then we'll touch base on Tuesday, which is very soon. Yes? So what are the odds of this thing creating a face that actually does exist? Um, uh, I remember we had a, an interesting discussion with the summer school I was attending. The experts, uh, well, when it comes to computer vi vision, are saying it's not possible. If all the humans have ever existed. It is not possible. It's, it's like saying, well, maybe. I mean, I was going to say it's like saying, we we'll find a person that looks like you. We've heard of such stories, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Find a person somewhere in Kenya who looks like you, and you know. But um, but I was told um, I've not really looked into. Um, image classification or computer vision that much, so I, I wouldn't know. But I've been told the people that work in this problem area that it's not possible. 
So no matter how long you take this, it's not possible. Okay, uh, this is good. And hopefully maybe some of us can work on some of these fancy things instead of the standard, no, I, I did that. Let's, let's strive to do what our colleagues out there are doing. Uh, I think some of the papers this time around should come from Sigaya. People are doing crazy things, right? So we'll see you on Tuesday then, and I will share the notes as soon as I get home. Thank you.